Greetings and welcome to another program of Christ the King. I'll be your host, Pastor Micah Klaus. Last week we began talking about biblical authority. Let me just add something to that. Practical application of biblical authority. Well, we just passed April 15th, and we had to pay our taxes, our local taxes, our federal taxes, all sort of taxes. Well, here's something practical that would have changed your past tax season if biblical authority was taken seriously by the state. For instance, the scripture seems to indicate, it's not a, a hill that I'm necessarily going to die on, but the scripture seems to indicate that the state should not demand of you more than what God requires of you. And what God requires is a tithe, which is literally coming from the word tenth. And so when the scripture talks about judgment that would come upon a people who defies God and chooses to serve a king or a governor or whoever it might be other than God, the scripture indicates that one of the judgments, and this comes from uh, the Lord and to, from the prophet Samuel talking to the people of Israel, that as they desired a king to put in the leadership as authority over them, and then they, as they rejected the Lord God, one of the judgments that would come upon them is that he would take a tenth of their fields, a tenth of their money. He would take their sons and daughters, etc., etc. So think about that. When the people of Israel were desiring a king and the Lord says to Samuel, Samuel, they have not rejected you, but they have rejected me as their king. And they prematurely demand a king so that they can be like the other nations. Samuel reports back to them that a judgment that's going to fall on their heads is a 10% tax. You see, they were going, if they were going to trade, exchange the true and living God for a mere man, a mere creature, whose life, whose breath is in his nostrils, then they're going to have to worship and pay him as a God. They're going to have to tithe to him. And this was a judgment. Now, what were your taxes like this past tax season? 20%, 30%, 35%, 40%? This is many times over what the prophet Samuel said a judgment would be whenever the people of Israel chose a human king over God the king. See, biblical authority has practical applications. If you bow before the Lord your God, you will actually be free. But if you refuse to follow him, you'll end up the slave of many masters. It's been said that a man has as many masters as he has vices. And so uh, be done away with serving other people and other things other than the Lord God, number one, and at the center of your life. Let me continue in this study on biblical authority. Jerry Bridges writes, God's word must be so strongly fixed in our minds that it becomes the dominant influence in our thoughts, our attitudes, and our actions. R.C. Sproul adds this countercultural remark about biblical authority. Our calling isn't to follow our hearts. Our calling is to have our hearts informed and directed by the clear and plain teaching of the word of God. Do you know what Psalm 119 says? This psalm has been called a hymn to the Word of God because at every single um, section of this amazing psalm, and it's the longest psalm we have in the whole Bible, talks about the laws, the commandments, and the Word of God. Hear what it says, Psalm 119, verses 33 through 40. Teach me, O Lord, the way of thy statutes, and I shall keep it unto the end. Give me understanding, and I shall keep thy law. Yea, I shall observe it with my whole heart. Make me to go in the path of thy commandments, for therein do I delight. Incline my heart unto thy testimonies, and not to covetousness. Turn away mine eyes from beholding vanity, and quicken thou me in the way. Establish thy word unto thy servant who is devoted to thy fear. Turn away my reproach, which I fear, for thy judgments are good. Behold, I have longed after thy precepts, quicken me in thy righteousness. Even in that short section we hear in Psalm 119, that God's judgments, his commandments, his way, and his word is good and perfect. This is what biblical authority means, is that the best way I can love my neighbor, 
is by loving them the way God says to love them. And the best way I can love my neighbor, um, even in terms of that example of taxes, is by supporting and by promoting biblical principles that will enable my neighbor to live a life that is full and not hindered by uh, a statist, overpowered, supercharged tax nation. That's how you. That's a practical way to love your neighbor. And we don't talk about that a lot. But like I said, the scripture seems to indicate uh, we ought to give to God more than any other authority. And yet, because we don't take biblical authority seriously, we often are uh, paying and giving more to things, far more than we give to the service and the work of the Lord our God. Our calling isn't to follow our hearts. Our calling is to have our hearts informed and directed by the clear and plain teaching of the Word of God. Do not be mistaken. The wisdom of Babylon also comes with the baggage of Babylon. Remember the story of Daniel and his three friends? They were brought into Babylon to be counselors, and they were known for their wisdom. They were known as having uh, wise counsel, and they were able to lead and direct the nation, much like Joseph was co-opted by uh, the Pharaoh to become second in command in Egypt. Moses uh, grew up in the instruction and in the learning of Egypt as well. But we have to know is this, that the wisdom of Egypt, the wisdom of Babylon, it comes with the baggage of Babylon. The philosophies of Egypt come with the bondage of Egypt. But the foolishness of the preaching of the gospel comes with the sweet riches of Christ. And so although the world may uh, tout and uh, brag and uh, proclaim their wisdom, that they have grown up, they have gone beyond God, and they don't need his book anymore, and that their wisdom and that their understanding far exceeds um, our past generations, and there's a lot of pride that comes with that. You know, the fifth commandment is honor your father and your mother, and C.S. Lewis said that One of the great sins of our day is chronological snobbery, is thinking that just because we're modern, just because we live in the day and age that we do, is that we must be automatically smarter and wiser than those that came before us. We oftentimes think of our great-great-grandparents as uh, prehistoric, as those that uh, just didn't really know everything that we do, and they had all sorts of hokey beliefs and all sorts of things. And to an extent, maybe they did. But actually, when you look back in history, um, they had wisdom and understanding And they had a fear of God, which is so greatly lacking today that I would argue that um, we have not progressed, but we have regressed. Anytime you take a step away from God, you have not made progress, but you've made regress. And so we might be able to boast about the wisdom of Babylon, the philosophies of Egypt. Now we know uh, what a person is and how we ought to live and all of these things. But then when it really comes down to it, we live in a day where people can't even define a man or a woman. This is where the wisdom of Babylon, the philosophies of Egypt, get you. But the foolishness of the preaching of the gospel. To the world, it's so foolish. Who would go and preach this gospel and actually expect disciples, actually expect people to be saved? But it pleased God in His wisdom, because the world did not know Him through wisdom, that He would use the foolishness of the preaching of the gospel to make peace with the earth and to come to them and be their Lord and their Savior. And so be like Moses. I named my son Moses because I I really look up to Moses here in the Scripture. Be like Moses. And, And you know what the Scripture says? He chose rather to side with God and suffer than to live lavishly in Egypt and face the ten plagues that were coming from the hand of the Almighty God. So consider that. To be a Christian in 2024 means you believe things that will get you laughed out of the room in elite and scientific and academic circles. You might believe, I hope, that as the scripture indicates that the earth is six to 10,000 years old. You believe that marriage is reserved in holy matrimony for one man and one woman one time. You believe that a man who was a, a rabbi and a teacher But so much more than that, the Son of God in the flesh died and three days later rose again. You believe in the scriptures that there was in the very beginning in the garden a talking serpent who led astray the woman who was deceived and then the man in his passivity and in his cowardice and his laziness also ate of the fruit 
And it was from the eating of that fruit that sin and death entered into the world. You believe things, Christian, that will get you laughed at. But you have to be like Moses and say, I'd rather choose to side with God, let God be true and every man a liar, rather than to live lavishly in the pomp and the circumstance of this world, because truly there will come a reckoning. There will, become, there will come a day of vindication when it actually unfolds and turns out that everything the world thought was their wisdom and their glory and what made them the great and mighty ones of the earth actually was just sheer stupidity and foolishness. And the perceived foolishness of the Christians about the age of the earth, about marriage, about the resurrection of the Son of God, that this man Jesus is actually able to save from death and from hell, that actually was perfect wisdom. That actually is what gave sanity and stability to people who believed it. And so, here's, here's your choice, listener. Side with the Lord God and walk through on dry ground. And then be fed daily with Jesus Christ. Or, remain in the temporary pleasures of Egypt and then face ten plagues, hardness of heart, and the complete disillusion of your nation. My counsel is this, side with the authority of God and his word and his gospel rather than the authority of man. Why do you fear man? Why do you trust solely in man whose breath is in his nostrils, who God made out of the dust of the earth? The authority of man is here and gone, but the authority and the power of God and his word, premierly his gospel, will remain forever. The scripture warns us, the arm of the flesh will fail you, but the Lord is mighty in battle. A.W. Tozer, I'll remind you, added this, Satan's greatest weapon is man's ignorance of God's word. Think back on your life. What foolish decision, what poor choice, what lifestyle mistake could have been avoided so quickly, so easily, had you not been ignorant of some aspect of God's Word. I think of times in my life where I just simply didn't know. And that's okay because we are, we are certainly learning. But at the same time, by all means, as possible by you, don't be ignorant of God's Word on purpose. Rather learn, rather grow in the grace and knowledge of Jesus Christ. When we twist Scripture to our liking, rather than to follow the intention of the mind of God, we make ourselves to be more authoritative than God, writes Daniel Chamberlain in the summary of Stephen Charnock's uh, discourses upon the existence and attributes of God. Basically what he's saying is the same thing that St. Augustine said uh, 1,700 years ago. If you pick and choose what you believe in the Bible, it is not God that you believe, but it is you that you believe. You believe yourself if when you come to the Bible, you pick and choose. You believe yourself if you twist it to your own liking rather than following the simple, plain intention of the mind of God. In like manner, J.C. Ryle commends this truth to us. Ignorance of Scripture is the root of all error and makes a man helpless in the hand of the devil. He has this statement in another work. The saddest road to hell is one that runs under the pulpit, past the Bible, and through the middle of warnings and invitations. So ignorance of Scripture is the root of all error, and you can be ignorant of Scripture all the while your path of life is going under the pulpit, past the Bible, and through all sorts of being in the middle of warnings and invitations. Don't let that be the case for you. Here's a simple step. Here's a simple application to the authority of God's Word in your life. Because we can't change uh, taxes all in one day. We can't uh, ask the government to bow to Christ all in one day. That would be wonderful. And Christ, by the Spirit, can do it. But if we're not submitting to the Word of God as the church, uh, why would we ever expect anyone to take us seriously if we were to call them, whether a family member, a friend, or the United States government, to bow before Christ if we are not doing it? So here's a simple application. Find a book of the Bible, uh, perhaps one you haven't read before, but one that maybe you heard quoted recently, you heard uh, scripture, seen a scripture recently, and sit down and start reading it. Now, if you're not a great reader, here's something I do. 
I listen to the Bible. You can find uh, all sorts of recordings of the Bible read out loud on the internet, on CDs, um, on, on all sorts of platforms. Listen to the Bible. If I was starting fresh, I would read, for instance, the Gospel of Mark or Paul's letter to the Ephesians, the book of Ephesians, and then continue, read 1 John, read the Gospel of John. Eventually, uh, sink your teeth into the total feast that is the book of Romans. And once you've read, I would say, you know, five or six books of the New Testament, start at the beginning of the Old Testament, right there, Genesis 1-1, and read your way through. And don't get discouraged if you don't understand everything the first time, because nobody ever has. Don't get caught up and say, I don't know what this is. You know, what is this stuff in Leviticus? And what, what in the world was Zechariah talking about and all of this stuff? Just keep reading. What God has for you is what you will understand your first time through and your second time through. And it'll be different insights and different glories that you find every time. Don't let difficulties or um, the inability to understand right away keep you from the Scripture. So like I said, Mark is a, a fairly short book. It's the shortest of the four Gospels. Ephesians is a very short letter, something you could read in under an hour or so. Read these, and you'll get a grasp of who God is, of what Christ did, even as he walked in the flesh, and what the church is. Find yourself a good church. Land yourself uh, in a body of believers where a man is preaching the Word of God and where not only uh, are people fellowshipping and enjoying each other's company, but you can see people growing in the grace of Jesus Christ, where they're challenged, where the, where the straight and narrow path uh, is not inappropriately broadened, or where the door that is Jesus Christ alone is not um, added to. You know, because that is what Jesus said in John chapter 10. It's the thieves who break in and steal, and who say there is other doors than Jesus. Now find a place where the straight and narrow path is taught and preached, and where the door of Jesus Christ, as the exclusive way to the Father, is brought before the congregation. After all, Jesus, who is the Word of God in the flesh, he responded to Satan's temptations and lies by what? By quoting the written Word of God, and not merely quoting it. Yes, he did that, but what did he also do? He believed it. He was not a hearer of God's Word only, but he was a doer. He was not merely there to quote the Scripture, but to believe it by faith. Satan would like nothing more than to take you away from Jesus, and by extension, take you away from the church. And also by extension, having separated from him, the word, the word in the flesh, to also distract you from his written word. Add to this, not only do you have a, a, a prowling lion who seeks to devour, but your own flesh, your own sinful inclinations and nature. If that is not disciplined and beat down under submission to the Holy Spirit of God, your flesh will make you doubt and wince and seethe at God's word. Even Charles Spurgeon warned, the Bible contains what men hate, the truth. See, that's the thing. It's not that people don't understand the Bible and turn away. It's often the case that people perfectly understand what the Bible is saying and because it testifies to the truth, the same reason they crucified the Lord of glory, the Lord of life, truth in the flesh, is the same reason people crucify their Bibles, throw them away, don't touch them, don't have them in their house, because their works are dark. Everyone can claim they're fine with the Bible until it's time to apply it. That's where the anger, the rebellion, skyrockets many times. However, uh, A.W. Tozer, again, boldly reminds us, we cannot afford to let down our Christian standards just to hold the interests of people who want to go to hell and still belong to a church. I'll read that again. We cannot afford to let down our Christian standards, the Word of God, the Law of God, just to hold the interest and entertain the goats who want to go to hell but still belong to a church along the way. No. We must in love and in truth speak this word, not lowering the standards, but saying this is what God has called us to. This is who God is, and he refuses to be a God who changes. He is the immutable, the unchangeable, mighty God. Doubtless, our personal knowledge and love of Scripture is not only good, 
but necessary. I hope you love the Word of God. We talked last week about it being sweet as honey. It's more valuable than gold. It's like healing ointment. Yes, uh, many parts of the Word of God are like that hammer and that sword. But once you fall upon the sword and Jesus resurrects you, you find that it is that sweet honey. It is that valuable gold. So it's not only good to love the Scripture, but it's necessary. For instance, how will you know if you're doing God's will? How else will you be able to tell if you're in the right or in the wrong? Or how will you know if someone is teaching what is actually true? The scripture says this. Here's how to know. Search the scriptures daily. Acts 17, 11. Be the noble-minded Berean who searches the scriptures daily. Then you will know. And what, am I hearing at church the truth or a lie? Are my ears being tickled or is my soul actually being served? I'll add this, and this is not from me, but this is from another gentleman who was preaching the word, and he uses some rough language here, but it's so important. He says this, if you're not reading your Bible seriously as a student, studying it every day, then you need to adjust that and make sure that's actually happening because you are marinating in anti-Christian sewage every day. The way this world thinks, the way the entertainment media will shape your minds, all of this, it really is opposed to the things of God. And you really need to have an influence that overwhelms all of that. And Jesus said, you don't just live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Treat your Bible like food. You need it that regularly. You need it that much. And you really do depend on it that, to that extent. So read it and study it. Don't just do the feel-good stuff expound the whole Bible. One way to do that is to attend your local church and to hear in the assembly a qualified man teach the scripture. And the Westminster Larger Catechism, it's a series of questions and answers to help people learn the Christian faith. And question 160 has this question, what is required of those that hear the word preached? What is required of someone who hears the word of God preached? What would, you, what would you answer this question? What is required of you? Have you ever thought about that? That something is required of you every Sunday that you go to church to hear the Word of God preached? When you hear it read aloud, when you hear it preached? Well, the answer the Westminster gives is this. It is required that those that hear the Word of God preached, that they attend upon it with diligence, preparation, and prayer. Examine what they hear by the Scriptures. Receive the truth with faith love, meekness, and readiness of mind as the Word of God. Meditate and confer of it, hide it in their hearts, and bring forth the fruit of it in their lives. All right, to summarize, we are to hear the Word of God preached, then do it. What does it say? You're to hear it with diligence. As much as you're able to, don't be distracted. Leave the distracting thoughts at the church's door when you walk in. And come in ready to receive. Just as when you walk into Eaton Park, or you walk into McDonald's, or you walk into a steakhouse, you walk in ready to eat. I've never seen anybody walk into a restaurant and, you know, have a parachute on because they were ready to jump out of an airplane. I never saw anybody walk into a restaurant and had a bowling ball in their hand because they were ready to, you know, uh, bowl the alleys. No. You walk in ready to eat, ready to get that steak, ready to get that hamburger. In the same way, as you walk into church on the Lord's Day, be diligent, prepared, ready. Get good sleep the night before. Be on the car ride there, pray that God would bless you with His Word. And as you hear it, receive it not as the Word of man. The Apostle Paul gives thanks to the churches in his day, saying, I thank God you did not receive this scripture. You did not receive our word as the Word of man, but as it is in truth, the Word of God. And as you hear it, receive it. You meditate on it means you chew on it, not just for the hour that you're at church, but you continue to chew on it throughout the week. You hide it in your heart that you might not sin against God. And as that word is planted in your heart like a seed, then you bring forth fruit in your life. Hear the word preached and then do it. This is applying biblical authority at the ground level. We're not going to be able to change the world in an hour. We're not going to be able to convert the nation in a minute. God can, don't get me wrong. But 
what can we do? What can you do Monday morning? What can you do Sunday morning? What can you do Saturday afternoon? Prepare your hearts to hear the word of God with brothers and sisters around you and then bring it into your home, mom, bring it into your home, father, dad, and see the culture of your home, something you do have authority over, something you do have great influence over, be changed, not by your personality alone, not by your taste and house rules, but ultimately changed first and foremost by the ever living word of God meditated through us, uh, to us through the Lord Jesus Christ. Just like the letter of James has been teaching, we are not to be mere hearers, but doers. And the Westminster Larger Catechism adds that we can do this best, hear the word of God, by preparing for it, doing things on Saturday night, like getting enough sleep, eating well, praying for God's blessing of clear thinking, praying for the minister who will preach, uh, praying that not only you, but all those in, in attendance, children, women, and, and men, would have open hearts and a soft heart, uh, so that when they hear the word of God, they'd be able to receive it. Uh, I love this, uh, I believe it's from John MacArthur. He says, soft preaching makes hard hearts, but hard preaching makes soft hearts. So pray that the word of God would come across hard, that the word of God would come across steadily, masculinely, manly, prepared for service, so that it might break sin, it might demolish idols, and yet also comfort the weak, encourage those that are in despair and lift up those that need the comforting, soothing word of God and gospel. The Puritans used to call the Lord's Day the market day of the soul, meaning that on the other six days you go to your job and, and fulfill your, your calling or career, but on the Lord's Day is the market day of the soul. What they meant is that just as through the work week we plan and expect to prosper our finances and home, through productive work and fruitfulness, so too the expectation going into the Lord's Day each week ought to be that you especially seek your soul to prosper, be fed, increase in love, and grow mighty before God. That is true wealth. That is true happiness. May God be with us all in this amazing endeavor. We confess that the Word of God was not sent or delivered by the will of men, but that holy men of God spoke, being moved by the Holy Spirit, as Peter says, the Word of God, just as the Ten Commandments were written with his own finger. The Word is holy and divine.